Thank you, Oliver, for blessing us with that song. At this time, we'll get uh, into the message. Everyone, please rise. And we'll begin uh, with the scripture reading for this morning. Let's read the scriptures together. This is, uh, and, and I tell you, Peter, yeah, this is Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And I tell you, you are Peter. Uh, let's read it together. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in, in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. Now that we've finished our series on 1 Corinthians, we are starting a new series today. However, our series is still kind of still going to continue with the theme that we have for this year, which is the building up of God's house. And in this series, we'll be looking at the various elements that are part of the process in building God's house, starting first with uh, some of the more general elements, uh, and then we'll move on into the more specific details. And if we were to look at it extremely broadly, there are really only two main elements to building. See some confusion, right? All of a sudden, Jesus starts talking about a rock. Why does he start talking about a rock when there's no, well, there, there's no rock that we know of? There. What is the rock that Jesus is speaking about? So we can start to think about it, right? Is Jesus talking about himself? Uh, in some Psalms, if you read the book of Psalms and you see some of the Psalms that David uh, writes, he might say that the Lord is my rock, right? So is that Jesus? And of course, we know that Jesus is also described as the cornerstone, just as in one of the uh, praise songs that we sang this morning. Could that be it? Or is he perhaps just talking about uh, something metaphorically, like the uh, confession of faith that Peter had just given him, that like, you are the Christ? Is that the rock? However, from what uh, I understand, Jesus is most likely talking about the person of Peter himself, right? Peter's name, if you read the Gospels, is originally Simon. That's why Peter is sometimes just called Simon Peter, to kind of clarify. But Jesus gave him the name Peter. He would call him Peter, or perhaps more specifically, he would call him Cephas, which is the uh, Aramaic form of, of the word uh, Peter. And so Peter's name in the Greek uh, is still based on the word rock, right? He, it's based on stone or rock. And so it, when you look at it, like in the Greek, it, it's kind of confusing, or maybe perhaps it's a bit more uh, clear. You are Peter, which is the rock, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now notice what Jesus says here. Jesus will build his church. So that settles it then, right? He is the builder, as we, have, uh, as we are talking about. What is the builder's plan for the building? What is Jesus' plan for the church? And with this, we'll, we'll turn our focus to the first key point of the message, and that is the builder is building on a firm foundation. Right? That is his intent. That is what he will do. And it makes perfect sense to start with a foundation. After all, God is a God of order, and he does things in an orderly way. We don't expect a, a lot of chaos, or else this world and universe will be very chaotic. No, he does everything in an orderly, orderly, orderly way. Jesus gave him the name Peter for a reason. He is to be the rock on which Jesus builds his church. Now, you may remember the teachings of Jesus uh, about building on rock, right? That's a pretty famous teaching. Uh, when I was a little boy, we would sing a song about it uh, in Sunday school. Uh, it's just a simple little song that teaches us about this uh, story that Jesus said in Matthew 7, uh, 24 and 25. And this reads, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. So the wise man built his house on the rock, and because it was on rock, it did not fall. The foolish man built his house on sand, and because it was on sand, it would fall easily to the wind and the rain. Now, if you ever read this story, you may think, oh, this is kind of silly, right? What, sure, we are talking about a foolish person, but even so, there, there has to be limits to foolishness, right? Why would you build your house on sand? However, in the summer months in Israel, uh, the heat would make the sands around the Sea of Galilee extremely hard, to the point where it seemed pretty solid, perhaps even solid enough to build something on it, build a house with no trouble. But it was a deceptive situation. After all, once the rain comes, then the sand is going to soften and start to fall apart. So a wise builder notices this, and he digs under the sand to, see, to search for the bedrock below, which would be firm. That way he could build his house on the bedrock where it would be strong and immovable. Even today, all our structures do need a firm foundation. Uh, if we don't want any accidents to happen, right? And certainly we have a lot of technology and techniques today to make it happen. We can build those foundations. Regardless, that's the idea, right? Every building needs a good foundation. And Peter would end up being the foundation for the beginning of the church. Now, we might ask, you know, it's not a physical building, so why should it need a strong foundation? Well, it still needs a strong foundation because it's still going to encounter opposition. Certainly not in the physical way, like with winds and rain, but there's going to be forces against it. In this case, we are referring to the spiritual war that is constantly waged against the church. That is why Jesus also says in verse 18 that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because the gates of hell are going to go against it, right? Hell is a real place. It is a place of death, destruction, anguish. It is a place of separation from God. And from the gates of hell comes those that have rejected God, the spiritual forces of evil. And so this image of the gates of hell helps us picture this opposition that is trying to bring down the church. These forces of evil are rushing out from the gates to go against the church to try and knock it down. Satan is a very real foe, and we would do our best to remember that, right? Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5.8 that the devil is like a prowling lion, always seeking to devour someone. By God's protection, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. But that doesn't mean it won't try. And although I want us to have full faith and confidence in the builder and in his plans, knowing that the church will remain until the end, and we'll certainly have our church, there will certainly be those who are saved and in the hands of God, the Bible also warns us. Each one of us needs to uh, understand that we have an individual responsibility to resist the devil by submitting ourselves to God. Although Jesus calls Peter the rock, the real essence of the foundation is the faith that Peter would have. You know, when we, we know the story of how when Jesus was betrayed, Peter started to lose faith, right? He would end up denying Christ three times. But even though he would lose his faith, it would be a little shaky. He never completely lost his faith. And from that point forward, Peter's faith was firm because it became the rock. God builds his church upon the faithful. Ever since the days of the early church, the church has been tested and tried numerous times. There have been much persecution. There have been many wars and acts of violence put against it. And even recently, we could say that churches now are suffering internally from uh, great confusion. They're losing sight of the truth of the gospel. They're starting to doubt whether or not we can accept the Bible in all of its entirety. And they're teaching heresies that have caused many to fall away or even despise the Christian faith. But in spite of all these oppositions, 
the true and faithful church of Christ still remains. And I have no doubt that it will continue to grow all over the world. It is a testament to the foundation of faith that Jesus builds upon. And as long as we stay true to the foundations that have been given to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the holy book, the holy Bible, this church will continue to stand. So let us remain faithful to the convictions given to us through the Holy Spirit. The next point I want us to look at is this. The builder builds towards a clear purpose. Now let's just briefly review Matthew 16, 19. And it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What does Jesus do to build his church? He gives Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And as we look at that, perhaps we can see a very clear symbol, right? It is the symbol of the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is certainly what we're, we hope for, is what we preach about. We hope to enter it. We hope to become citizens of this kingdom of which God is going to be our king, or he is already our king. And before Jesus came and brought the gospel, the way to heaven seemed impossible. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God revealed his law to the Israelites, but nobody could really keep that law. But now, through the gospel, the way is open. The keys have been given. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are given to all who know the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of Jesus as the Christ. Just as the keys to the kingdom have been given to Peter, so also they have been given to us. The gospel is our key to the way to heaven. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Now, if we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, Paul lived his life really for the sake of the gospel. That's why he says in this verse, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Everything he did for Jesus, we can't consider it like a hobby or something on the side. It wasn't even really like a full-time job of any sort. It was really just his life in its entirety. After his conversion experience, on the road to Damascus, from that point forward, everything he did was for the sake of the gospel. There was clear purpose. He was what we call purpose-driven. And because it was a purpose that was given to him from the Lord Jesus. So it should be no mystery to us. The builder is building towards a clear purpose that we can all understand and see. That the gospel may be preached to the ends of the earth that people might receive the salvation of Jesus Christ and have peace. Jesus commanded it through the Great Commission, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to be obedient to him. So there is this clear purpose, and we are to always remember that purpose. We should be seeking to know and understand the fullness of his purposes. You know, back when uh, I was in Georgia, most of our English group, that I was uh, re helping out and ministering to, it was really just the youth group. We didn't have uh, many adults. And so many of them were just teens in high school and in middle school. And during a number of events, they would, of course, enjoy fellowship time by playing games together. Uh, some of the games that they enjoyed to play together were like the guessing game, games like uh, Pictionary or Drawful, uh, where you would draw things and people would try to guess what they were drawing, or maybe even charades, you know, the ones where it's basically the same thing, but instead of drawing, you try and act it out without saying a word. And so they would play these games where you try to guess what the other person is trying to communicate. And so there was one time when we had a lock-in at the church. A lock-in is basically when the youth group can stay in the church and sleep over for a night. Uh, and so during that time, they would play a bunch of these kinds of games for hours. And we would normally do boys versus girls. And it was fun for a while until we started to realize that the girls would just keep winning over and over again. Now, it didn't take long for us to figure out the problem because, you see, the girls' team had two sisters that were extremely close. They weren't twins, but they were close enough in age that they were able to communicate uh, with each other on a completely different level than any of us, right? they would draw or act out very specific things, things that like point to, uh, say, for example, like a guy they met two 
weeks ago at school during an orchestra. Uh, and he was wearing a special shirt. He did something very unusual. And because of that, they were able to like point to some specific word about what happened during that time. And the other sister would just know the answer instantly. Nobody else understood what was going on, but this, the other sister would be able to answer. And that's how they would play all the games. They would go to all these specific memories that they had with one another, right? Like what the birthday gift that you got last year or Remember how you tried to learn to do this last month? Or remember that time you fell at the park? So they would have all these specific memories that they could point to and basically cheat with because nobody else knew what was going on. And it, it's kind of like the inside joke, right? Where a small group of friends can laugh together about something that seems almost out of place, something that was so random because they know specifically what that one person is just referring to. These sisters had inside knowledge. They were the only ones in on it, but they were so, they just knew each other so well, they had so many shared experiences, so much knowledge about one another that they could just instantly know what each other, what their minds were, were going, what each other's minds were thinking and going through, making it very unfair. So because these sisters could do this, they could be on the same page, know what the other one was thinking, what the other one was planning, they could understand fully what their purpose was whenever they did uh, act out these things for people to guess. And I say that because we have to understand that there's indeed a very clear purpose that God is doing here with our church. And so the more we learn about God, the more we understand his purposes, then the more easily we can get on board with whatever God is doing. When he does things and we see his, the moving of what he's doing in the church, then we can just say, okay, I understand. This is what God wants us to do, and we know the answer to, as how to proceed. Because he has a purpose for building the church, and it's clear. He has this plan for growing the church. Sometimes the details are not clear. Right? We know we need to share the gospel. We need to uh, make disciples. But sometimes we can get lost in the details. We have this idea, a vague idea of how we want to do it, but God always has a specific plan for how he wants to do it. What is the best way to do these things? We don't always know for sure. Even so, we keep these purposes at the forefront, right? We stay the course for God's overall plan. And as we continue to grow in knowledge, as we continue to grow uh, in fellowship as a church, then we will realize that God is just going to make these purposes clearer. We're going to see what he's doing and be able to uh, work with him in what he's doing. That's why we continue to seek his direction as our church continues to grow. As long as we have the mindset that Paul had, that we are simply doing everything for the sake of the gospel, we will not be led astray. And this leads to our last point for today, and that is the builder is building with the right materials. Now for this section, I'd like for us to read Ephesians 5, 17 to 17. Uh, 15 to 17, and it reads, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, our focus today is on the builder, right? We've looked at what the builder has already done, uh, in that he's been laying down foundations of faith. We see what the builder is still doing, in that he's already declared his clear purposes to us through the Great Commission. But now what? As we already mentioned before, the builder has this plan, has this purpose. So our goal then is not to uh, do anything against it, right? We are not supposed to go against it. We're not supposed to change it. And we're not supposed to even just ignore it, thinking that we can just do our own thing and it'll all work out just as, as God intended, right? We cannot think that we know better than the builder and expect that God will choose to just follow along with our plans rather than we are to follow with his plans. Instead, our goal is to understand what is God doing, and then we can fit right into it. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, uh, and it, he's essentially saying, pay attention to how you live. When Paul talks about walking, all right, we know that he's talking about walking as in living your life. This is why the Bible sometimes says, you know, 
that the person is walking with God. This is how we walk with God. This is the way that we live. And in the way that we live, we must be wise and not unwise. In the way that we live, we should be making the best use of our time on this earth because it is short. It is limited. And we also struggle with a lot of evil, right, in, in our lives. So because of this, we have to do our best to make the use of the time. But how do we do that? How do we make best use of our time as disciples of Jesus Christ? And it's by understanding the will of the Lord, by understanding the will of the builder. And nowadays, a lot of things require assembly, right? We, we have desks and tables and chairs and uh, other household items that you can just get in a box, right? Whether you buy it from the store, whether you get it online, it can just come nice and convenient in a box with all of its pieces, but unassembled. And we know that every piece in that box is going to be necessary. It's designed so that you can just put it all together, so that you can build it as intended. Now, if we were look at in look at it in this way, the builder in this case is the designer. He's already have uh, he already has the whole thing laid out, and at for him to uh, get uh, so that the product will be complete, right? And when you buy such a product, you know what you're getting, right? Whether you look at the uh, picture of what the product is supposed to look like, or you actually look at the instructions and see how it's supposed to go, you know that all these pieces, they are supposed to go together in some way and, and form whatever it's supposed to form, whether that's a desk or a chair or whatever it is. And when you put these stuffs together, it's just more helpful to know what it looks like, right? You have an idea, oh, this is what it's supposed to be. So I know that this is how it's going to look. Right? And so I know that all these pieces, they, they, they look like they can fit together in that way. That way, the piece, every piece can come together as intended to become the right product that you wanted to buy in the first place. As God builds his church, we become like the little parts and the pieces, the materials for the building. Therefore, our desire should, become to, should be to become the right part. The, the right material that for what God is building. What is God doing in your life? Right? The answer to that question cannot be nothing. Right? It can, it's not always a big thing, like a call to uh, another country to do long-term mission work, but God is always working in all of our lives, no matter what's going on. Although God is in control of all things, we have that personal responsibility to walk with God. And the more we surrender ourselves to his will, the more he can mold us, transform us into that right material that he needs for the building. So how is your walk with God today? Are you seeking his will for your life? Are you living wisely through the heavenly wisdom? Are you responding to his call? Are you aligning yourself with his will, with his plans, instead of trying to force your will and your plans upon him. God has already got this big plan over all these things, whether it's your life or over this church. And he's always working, building this church. But if you want to be fully a part of that plan, if you want to see your life transformed by him, you have to best do your best to know his will and follow it. Right? This is the challenge for us whether we're talking just about our personal spiritual life or we're talking about our hopes and dreams for this church as a whole, we must be continually seeking his will every step of the way. Because once we follow his will, his plan, we get to see and experience uh, God's perfect building, his perfect design for our lives. Do you want to see that? I know I want to see it. Let's close in a word of prayer and ask that God may continue his work in our lives. Oh, Lord, our God, our Father in heaven, uh, I thank you, Lord, for just giving us your word, giving us that which we can hear from you, O oh Lord. Even though we cannot hear uh, your voice clearly, even though we do not see your presence 
clearly, O oh Lord, you have given us everything we need to know you, to follow you. And I just pray, O oh Lord, that uh, we would have that heart, the hunger, the spiritual desire to really seek after you, to really seek your will, to know your will for our lives. For we know, Lord, that you are good and you are perfect. And on top of all that, you love us. You care for us. You want what's best for us. So, Father God, I really ask. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that we would be more open to you, that we would be more receptive to you, that we would actively seek you and your will. And I pray, O oh Lord, that we would really feel your presence guiding us. Though we may not be like the 12 disciples who could walk uh, physically next to Jesus, I pray, O oh Lord, that we would still walk humbly with you, Lord, as our Lord and Savior, to know that you are with us every step of the way. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would really continue to build this church up. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would see your mighty works in this church as you build it up, Lord, as you build each and, one of us, each and every one of us. Mold us, O oh Lord, transform us, make us the right piece, the right part. so that each and every one can fit together in fellowship, in peace, in harmony, in love. And so show the world that you are the truth, that you are the way, that you are the life. You have given us the keys to the kingdom. May we be good uh, stewards of that key to open the way to the kingdom of heaven, to many more in the days to come. And I just pray all this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.